Well, um, hello again to everyone. In the, the previous lecture today, we, we, we uh, dealt with uh, space. Now, in this lecture, we will deal with time. And uh, time is very important for planning, uh, as uh, Arthur Bitmono and Andrea Micheli, who will be presenting this lecture, will explain in, in a moment. So both of them have um, been working on temporal planning uh, for their PhD and since their PhD. Arthur is uh, uh, in Toulouse. Uh, he is an associate professor at the uh, Applied Science Institute there and a researcher at LAS. Uh, his research interest lies in autonomous decision making. He worked on temporal planning and axing for robotic systems and he uh, developed the uh, FAPE planner. He also worked on planning for fleet of drones and for optimal uh, carpooling in multimodal networks. Andrea Micheli is in Trento, Italy, and he's a researcher at the uh, FBK ICT uh, Institute. And uh, his uh, research interests uh, include planning in continuous domains and temporal reasoning under uncertainty, with um, a focus on controllability issues in planning with respect to time. He has also worked on uh, SAT modular theory, especially in linear and nonlinear real arithmetics and quantified theories as a technology uh, for planning and for handling time. So thank you, Arthur and Andrea, for contributing to the summer school, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Malik, for the nice introduction. And uh, exactly as you said, today we are talking about temporal planning. I, this is pretty much the, the program of the lecture that we are, that we are gonna have. So I will start by giving you a bit of introduction, uh, what is temporal planning, giving a bit of motivation, application, and discussing uh, quickly the complexity, the computational complexity. Then Arthur will talk about temporal reasoning uh, with different uh, algebras that you can use. And in particular, uh, he will focus on simple temporal networks. Then I will talk about state-oriented techniques, so techniques in which uh, the state uh, representation and the state part is prominent. Um, and we, discuss, we are going to discuss different techniques, uh, a family of, of different techniques. And finally, we will discuss time-oriented techniques. So when planning is done as a sort of scheduling, you will see more about this later. Um, so let's start with the introduction. Ah, sorry, by the way, uh, if it's okay for you, with Arthur, we, we decided to uh, have your questions be, uh, between the different sections. So feel free to write your questions uh, online during, uh, on the chat and I, I will read or Arthur will read the question while we, we switch uh, the floor, okay? Okay, so let's start with the introduction. Probably you are already familiar with what planning is, but just a couple of words. So planning is a deductive technique given a model of a system and the goal to be reached that can be, you know, different kind of model, different kind of goals. The objective is to find a course of actions to drive the system to the desired goal. And uh, this is pure, pure reasoning, right? So all the solutions are already encoded in your, uh, your model. The job of the planner is basically to reason and to extract uh, this solution, okay? This is just a simple example that I stole from uh, Malik's uh, book. Uh, essentially, you have uh, a, word, a number of possible situations of the world and you have actions, so you have a sort of transitions that allow you to, to move from one state of the world to another, right? And the job of a planner is basically to explore this graph of possibilities in order to find a plan, so a, a sequence of actions or a, or a strategy that is gonna um, drive your system from the current state to one of the goal states that you have. So probably this is already very clear to all of you. The difference is tempor in temporal planning is that uh, time and temporal constraints are considered in the model. So for example, you can imagine having deadlines. Uh, so not only find a way to go to, from point A to point B, but also you need to do it within a certain deadline. And you consider the duration of the actions. So going, for example, from one point to another does, doesn't take zero time, it takes some amount of time, maybe depending also on exogenous conditions. So you have this interaction between time and the decision, the actions or the, the, the discrete decision that you are gonna make. And 
So ju just to give you a visual idea, the, dif the key difference between, for example, classical planning and temporal planning is that in classical planning, you're gonna search for a sequence of actions, whilst in uh, uh, temporal planning, you're gonna search essentially for a Gantt chart, right? So each of the actions will have uh, a certain duration. So it's an interval of time, like you can see here at the bottom. And um, you're gonna essentially search for a, an appropriate timing for uh, starting, the, uh, for executing the different actions and uh, which actions you're gonna execute. Um, what makes temporal planning hard and also interesting is that action can overlap and interfere. So it's not a simple sequence of actions that have a certain duration, but uh, within the, the, the interval that is constituting an action, um, you can, there, there can be events that, that happen. And so there, there can be interference between two actions that are executing in parallel. Okay, the key intuition here, the key problem of temporal planning is that uh, we want to decide two things at the same time. We want to decide both what to do and when to do it. This is somehow similar to the previous lecture in which you had to decide which task to do and how to realize the motion, right? The, the concept is similar here. We want to decide which actions to take and when to take it. So we are coupling the problem of, this, of the, plan, the classical planning, deciding what to do with the problem of scheduling, deciding when to do it, okay? Good, so we are interested in temporal planning, not just because it's hard, but also because it, it has a lot of interesting uh, applications. So these are just examples, there are many more. So optimal control in known or partially known environments, like you have a factory, you know how the machine work, uh, you know how many works, how many workers, how many resources you have, and so you want to, to decide how to uh, operate a different machine, how to use the different resources in order to uh, achieve a desired production to produce a certain, a certain item, a certain good. Uh, another example is robotics, for example, mission planning. Uh, so you can have exploration rovers. Uh, by the way, space uh, is one of the big uh, domains uh, in which uh, temporal planning has been used and was practically born. So there are uh, planners done by NASA, by ESA, that are used by, for scheduling and for uh, uh, planning the, mi the, the, the robotic missions on Mars, for example, or uh, on the satellites, right? Um, planning, temporal planning is also useful for drones, uh, underwater vehicles, and so on. Mike, for example, worked on project on underwater vehicles with temporal planning. Um, and it's also interesting for safety critical recovery. So when you have, for example, a satellite, uh, maybe you don't have the time for uh, uh, upload a new plan. So you really want some kind of autonomy uh, on the satellite. And uh, there you, you typically have very, let's say, strict time constraints and you need to reason about time, okay? so. Temporal planning has a lot of interesting application. Arthur will also probably talk about uh, uh, some other. Um, this is just a technical note, uh, especially if you, if you approach the literature and you, uh, you are not careful, th this can, be, can cause troubles because there are different uh, planners and different techniques that work with discrete time or dense time, okay? So it really depends uh, what is time for you, what is the domain of time for you. So if you consider, the events to happen at discrete steps. For example, you are only caring about uh, milliseconds, for example, and between two milliseconds, uh, you are not modeling what happens, then you are in discrete time. And there are techniques for, do for dealing with that. Um, instead, other planners can also reason on continuous time or dense time. For example, they assume that the, the domain of time is Q, so the, the rational numbers or the, the real numbers. Clearly, this can make a lot of difference. For example, if you, if you imagine having an action that has a constraint saying that the duration is greater than zero, and you ask yourself the question, how many, how many actions can you fit in 10 time units? If you are in, in discrete time, this number is finite, it's 10. Um, if uh, instead you are in dense time, actually you can fit infinitely many, right? So you can already imagine that th this makes quite a lot of difference for the, for the technique. Okay. Just a warning, don't be fooled. Uh, in planning, sometimes it's true that discrete time is easier, uh, but in general, in computer science, it is not true. So for example, if you consider linear programming over the rational, it's a polynomial problem. There is the ellipsoid algorithm, while over the integer is MP complete. So it's not always the case that discrete time is easier than dense time. 
In planning, computational, computationally, it's true. So this is a number of results. Uh, the difference between the, 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 the different papers that you find here in the theorems uh, are that they, they target different kinds of languages, right? For example, Rintan in 2007 targets uh, sort of a PDDL language, so uh, a language that, that has uh, discrete steps with epsilon separation. Uh, Gigante et al. 2020 instead uh, deals with continuous uh, dense time. And uh, uh, Gigante in 2017 instead is, is about timelines, so a language that is more uh, for time oriented techniques. Um, and so, temporal planning with discrete time in general, in all, regardless of the language, is X space complete. Uh, instead, if you, if you take the dense time, in general, it's undecidable. We will see a bit later that some interesting uh, fragments of, of the problem are decidable and are actually uh, easy to solve, easy, relatively easy to solve. Um, but in general, with dense time, it is undecidable. Okay, so this, this, uh, this is about the introduction. So I will give you the, fl the floor to, to Arthur for the, for the temporal reasoning part. Um, if you have any question, I will be happy to answer them. In the meantime. Okay. Okay. So about temporal reasoning. Um, so why do you want to, to reason about uh, time? So um, let's consider that you have a plane like this one where you have five actions in blue and they have relations between them, which are represented by arrows and that typically say that sample should be before analyzed, which itself should be before transmit data. So you have these uh, temporal constructs, the actions, and they relate to other things. So that's a, a start time point, and there's also external things like uh, for a satellite. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, the visibility window of a satellite. And in order to transmit data to it, you need to uh, essentially transmit data between these uh, visibility windows. So essentially plans, when you interested in temporal planning has lots of uh, temporal relations and what we're going to see there is how can we reason about them and the questions uh, that we want to to be able to answer is uh, is a plan uh, consistent which means that there's no deadlocks between actions uh, that all deadlines are met so that kind of um, global uh, queries about a plan but that you might be interested in about occurrence time of actions that will be the earliest and latest start times for your actions about relative ordering so whether action a can be before an action b and and the last one would be dispatchability so is there a strategy to execute my plan and um, that fulfills all the temporal constraints right okay and and so there's two main constructs for this so the first one are uh, intervals that I define as a contiguous subset of time uh, characterized by a start time and a duration. So I say contiguous because if you're in, in discrete uh, time, then it's not a continuous interval, but the main thing that you're not allowed to have uh, gaps uh, in, inside an interval, right? And then you have the time point, which is a single point in time and it is typically related to a particular instantaneous event. So that would be the start of an action or the end of an action. Okay. That the, the two main uh, building blocks. And of course, you can express an interval as two time points with the start and the end of it. And if you have a duration, uh, then you, you just have to fulfill the constraint that the delay between the start and the end uh, is equal to the duration. So you can go from one representation to the other. Okay. So now to reason about this, in general, we'll have temporal networks. Uh, and I'm going to present a, a general view of them and then we're going to see a few uh, instances of those temporal networks. So temporal networks are graphs where the nodes are temporal references that would be time points or intervals. And the edges represent the temporal relations between them. That would be saying that uh, a time point is before another or at the same time or after it, typically. 
And then for those kinds of network, we're interested in uh, knowing whether they're consistent. So which is whether there exists a valid instantiation of all references, if there's no contradiction in the constraint that I expressed. And for this, there's two operations that are uh, critical to, to reason about this. So the first one is compositions, which is uh, given um, two subsequent edges like these ones, how do you compose them into a single one, right? Uh, so essentially you take a pass, uh, a relation between three nodes and you compose them into a relation between two nodes, right? So you, you, com you compose them, you concatenate them. And with another reasoning rule that is critical, which is intersection. She's given two relations between the same nodes, that would be this edge and this z edge, or do you intersect them? So or do you build a new edge that is stronger than those two and essentially contains all the information needed from the first one and from the second one, okay? That's a very general uh, framework and then we're going to, to see different instances of it. So the first one would be point algebra. So in point algebra, you're interested into qualitative ordering between time points where an ordering is that given two time points A and B, exactly one of the following will be true. Either we have A before B or we have A after B. And if we are in neither of those cases, it means that they have exactly the same occurrence time. Right? And so from these orderings, we can define the relations. And essentially a relations gives a set of possible ordering uh, between two time points, right? So you denote it by an edge, and then you will put on the edge the set of allowed relations, where the set of relations, of ordering, sorry, can be one of those. So if you have only one, you can say that it's before, after, or equal. That's the thing you can say with a single ordering in the set, but you can have more than one, and in this case, it means it will be one of the two orderings. So if you are if you have uh, these relations, mean that A should be before or equal to B, and you have two others like this one, this one means different because it means you can be before, you can be after, but you cannot be equal to the other time point. And you have two, uh, two special cases, which is the one where you have no allowed ordering, which is a contradiction, and you have the one where everything is allowed, which is a tautology. And so if we take two examples, so this relation means that A must be before B, and this one means that A must be either before or equal B, okay? That's the kind of relation that you can express in point algebra. And of course, then we have the composition intersection rules. So composition is that given a sequence of ages, how do you find a new one from A to C there, okay? Uh, that's what we want to infer. And we have a composition um, uh, symbol there uh, that we're going to use to define this, uh, this composition. So let's say we want to compose these two edges. So from one, so which means that uh, one should be before two and two should be equal to three. So if we want to compose it, we're going to have a new edge that takes a composition of these two relations, right? And now to find what this is, we're going to look in our composition table. So we want to compose before with equal. And so we look in the table, we get before composed with equal. So the resulting edge should be a before. And this makes sense. If T1 is before T2 and T2 is at the same time of T3, then T1 should be before T3 as well, right? And that's what composition gives you. So you have a composition table that allows you to compose any pair of edges, and then you can infer an, a new edge uh, by composing two, okay? So the other, um, the other operation is intersections. And for, for this case, we have two edges between the same uh, nodes, and we want to infer a new one and the way we do that is with set intersections. Because if you look at these nodes, this means that N1 is allowed to be either before or equal, and this 
mean that n1 is allowed to be after or equal. That's, and, and essentially, to have a valid relation, you should have a relation that is valid here and here, all right? And so the way you do this, you do this intersection is simply by taking the intersection of uh, valid relations. So you take uh, your relations, you take the intersection, and in the end, it means that the two nodes should be equal, all right? And, and this has an interesting property, which is that the new edge is stronger than the two existing one. Right? So because everything in this set um, must be in both sets, uh, this relation, this constraint, is stronger than the two previous one. So you can remove the two other ones and get on a single edge. Okay. Uh, and now there's a way to reason about this in a more uh, in a more automated manner, which is uh, applying past consistency. And, and I'm just going to, to give the key ID, but essentially it means that for each triangle of nodes like this one, so I, J, and K, you're going to take one edges, one edge, so the R1, K, and you're going to update it with... Um, you're going to intersect it with the composition of the other one. So you're going to update these edges so that it contains the composition of these two. So if we do this, um, we, you're going to compose this edge, right? Uh, which will give you, that's the example we saw, uh, less, uh, equal, uh, strictly less. So I must be uh, before k. And then when you intersect with this one, you're going to get uh, this relation. Okay, and if you apply this in a, in a systematic way, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to infer all orderings between all pairs of time points. And you have a nice property which say that the nest work is consistent if after doing that, all pairs of time points, that should be a time points, have a valid ordering, which means that there's no pair of time point that has no possible relations. And this is if this is true, then you have a solution to the network. Okay, so that was for point algebra, and then we can do a very similar thing for interval algebra, which is qualitative orderings, not on time point, but on intervals. So you can say, for instance, that an interval of time i is before j, so that's one of the possible relations. But then if you start moving your interval to the right, you can say that i meets j, which means that the n of i is the start of j, right? And you have lots of, uh, of relations uh, for those ones. And essentially, at each time you move, uh, you move one of the intervals, you get a new, a new relation. So that's i before j, i meets j, so the n of i Oops. at the uh, start of J, and if you keep moving, they will be overlapping, then they will start at the same time, they will be during, so I is uh, entain, entirely contained in J, and then they finish at the same time, another one is that they should be equal. Okay, so that's the seven basic relations, and then for all those six ones, you have the inverse property, which is, uh, so before will become after, uh, but we typically note it with the before prime. Okay, so that's so there's 13 relations in total for Allen's interval algebra. And we're not going to get into details, but then you also have an intersection operation, which is the set operation, and you have a composition matrix, which uh, on, we only have part of it here. But then essentially the thing works exactly the same thing. So you have intervals, you have relations between them, so that before and meet, and you can uh, reason in a similar way by inferring the composed uh, the composed edge, which will give you a before, and then if you intersect these two ones, you will get um, a before relation between these two intervals. Okay, not going to get into more details. Uh, one important thing to note is that uh, you can express uh, the interval algebra into point algebra, and this is uh, typically a way to have a, a more um, um, a smaller number of primitives to deal with. Right. Okay. So
So now we're going to, to focus, and this is uh, perhaps a very important uh, part of the lecture, to simple temporal networks, uh, which, are the, which are the building blocks of many temporal uh, reasoning frameworks. So in STN, you have quantitative orderings between time points. So what this means is that you allow to bound the delay between two time points. So let's look at, at this example. That's a kind of constraint that are allowed. So you have a time point B and a time point A, and you allow to say that the difference between the two is, is less or equal to 10 and greater or equal to minus 10. So what this means is that TA and TB should not occur more than 10 seconds apart. And the way we represent that in a temporal, in an STN, is with this constraint, which can be read at the delay between from A to B should be in this minus 10, 10 interval, okay? And we can have other kinds of constraint or the uh, constraints. So for instance, this one, say that TB must occur between five and seven seconds after TA, which is this constraint there. Right? So you, essentially you give bounds, lower and upper bounds on the delay between two time points. Okay, that's uh, the, the main building block. And then you can also define composition in intersection. So for composition, you can say that, uh, so here you have, you want to combine these two edges, right? So this means that uh, to go from T1 to T2, I need at least L and I need at least L prime to go from T2 to T3. And so to define composition between from T1 to T3, you can say that I need at least L plus L prime to go from T1 to T3. That's a composition of the two edges. And you can do the same thing for the upper bound. So I need at most U to go from one to two and U prime to go from two to three. And this gives me an, a global uh, a general upper bound of U plus, plus U prime. Okay, that's for composition and intersection where essentially you get the intersection of uh, the two intervals. So that means that the allowed uh, delay between N1 and N2 are in this interval and should also be in this interval. So you just take the intersection between the two, which gives you this expression, okay? So now we've defined composition intersection, but there's one thing that is a bit annoying with uh, this representation is that you actually have two ways to represent the same constraint. So if you bound the difference, you can uh, have this one. So the delay between A and B is between one and two, but you can also say the other way around by just multiplying everything by minus one and saying that the delay between TB and TA is between minus two and minus one. And this is exactly the same thing. And so the way we deal with this in STNs is by uh, having a distance graph where we only allow the upper bounds on the difference. This means we're only going to keep those two constraints, this part, the right part of these constraints, there and there, and we have a, a new graphical representation, which essentially gives the max delay between two time points. So this means that the max delay from TA to TB is two, and this means that the max delay from TB to TA is minus one, which is equivalent to say that the minimum delay from TA to TB is one, okay? So if we, if we do this systematically on a nestian like this one, you will get a distance graph such as this. Um, essentially, you replace each edge by two edges that give both the max and the minimum delay, okay? And you can define composition uh, in a similar way. So essentially you have uh, if you go from A to B and B to C in two and 10, then the maximum delay will be two plus 10. This is equivalent to, uh, to going this way. So the max delay from O to A and A to B uh, would be 12 there, okay? Because you can define the composed edge going directly there. And then when you have the intersection, you have the same kind of relation where if a should be at most one time unit after B and at most one five time units after B, uh, then you can get the minimum of these two to get the new constraint. Uh, and now 
the very interesting thing about this distance graph is that you can reason on shortest paths and they are very interesting property. Uh, the very interesting property is that a shortest path from X to Y or O to B there uh, gives you the maximum delay between two time points. So here the shortest path from A from O to B will be 12. And that means that the maximum delay that can occur between O and B will be 12. And if you look in the in the other way, uh, if I get the shortest path from B to O, that will give me the minimum delay from O to B. It's just the maximum delay minus one in the other order. Right? So essentially, by looking at shortest paths, you can get the minimum and maximum delay between time points. Right? And this is not very surprising because uh, a pass is just a sequence of edges and you get the composition of the edges by thumbing the labels on it. Okay, So a composition is just a shortest pass operation, right? Uh, a, a pass operation. And then when you get the intersection, you get, you keep the minimum of each pass. And that's what we saw there. If you have two paths from A to B, you will only keep the minimum one. So essentially with this, you compute your pass, and with this, you only keep the minimum one. Um, and, and this property is very interesting and because it allows us to use all uh, shortest pass algorithms to reason on simple temporal networks. So the, the first one will, would be to get the earliest and latest start time of time points. What you can do is do a one to all shortest pass. If I'm in O, which would be uh, the initial event, right, temporal origin, I can get a shortest path from O to all of the time points and get their latest start time. So if I do this, I will get that the shortest path from O to A is 2, uh, from O to B is 12, from O to C is 5, right? And that would be the maximum delays, the, I mean, the latest time for those time points. And I can do uh, a similar trick uh, by computing the shortest pass, but going uh, backward in my edges to get the minimum delay. So if I want to go, uh, if I do this, I will get that the, the shortest pass in the backward graph from O to A is minus one, minus six for B and minus three for C. And this will give me uh, the minimum delay the, the earlier start time for this time point, right? Uh, and so that's uh, what you do if you want to get these, uh, essentially the domains of those time points. And now there's another algorithm that is very useful in practice, uh, which is to get the delays between all pairs of time points. So the, the principle that you get, you do an all pair shortest pass algorithm, and this will give you for each uh, pairs of node, the distance from uh, from from one to the other. So, for instance, there we can find that the distance from B to C is minus two, which means that C must necessarily occur at least two time units. Uh, that, that C must occur at least two time units after. No, sorry, B should occur at least two time units after C. Okay, so we have inferred. Uh, total ordering between those two time points by right? looking at this. Okay, and those, mm, at this point, so we can compute the delays between either an origin or uh, the um, or two pairs of time points. Uh, there's just one cap that sometimes the STM might not be consistent, uh, which means that there's no valid instantiation of the time points. Right. So we have a, another nice property, which is an ISTN is consistent if and only if there's no cycle of negative lengths in the distance graph. Just, just taking an example, uh, let's say we have a deadlock saying that A is before B and B is before A. That would be the different constraints. So B is before A and A, uh, sorry, uh, B is after A. Okay, so A is before B and B is before A. And this will result in a negative cycle in this STM, right? And 
uh, and essentially the shortest pass algorithm can detect these kind of settings and and that's how you detect inconsistency once soon as you have a cycle you have an inconsistency you can have the same thing for deadlines uh, which also results in negative cycles in your STM and just to to wrap up and to to give a, an, an important uh, view uh, so once you have a negative cycle the edge is considered an unsatisfiable subset of constraints which means that if you want your STM to become consistent you need to remove one of those edges and this is a uh, very valuable information because it allows you to know what is the problem in your temporal network. And this can be exploited in, 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 in planning as well. Okay, so that was for simple temporal networks. Uh, essentially, uh, simple temporal networks is the building blocks of many temporal reasoning frameworks and there's many extensions to it to reason about uncertainty where you have contingent events uh, about uh, settings where you have a disjunctive constraint so you should be for instance either before or after uh, and you want to express that directly in the network you have things where you have conditional stms which means there's not such will execute depending of external factors uh, multi-agent stms where you have to synchronize between different agents and time dependent stms which is where the duration of edges depends on the current time. So for instance, if you want to go to the office, it will take much longer if you're uh, during a time where there's lots of traffic or not. And the last point is, uh, is about executing an STM dispatching. And this paper is about putting it in a form where you can execute an STM very efficiently. And with that, I will uh, close this part. Uh, maybe we can take, uh, I will see if there's questions. I can read it for you if you want, there are two. Yes. So uh, Mustafa asks, uh, is there any temporal relations which cannot be represented by an STN? Uh, yes, well, for instance, uh, I just mentioned your dis disjunctive one. If you want to be, um, well, so let's say you have a satellite that is visible twice and you want to schedule, uh, you want to transmit data, then your transmission interval should fit either in the first uh, visibility window or in the second. And that's typically a relation that you cannot express in an STM because you have this disjunctive part. And another question uh, from John is uh, on the Bellman Ford solution uh, mm -hmm. that you had in your example, I guess. Is it guaranteed that the corresponding negative edges of the shortest path from O to A yield the shortest path from A to O? Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, but probably the answer is yes, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the shortest pass algorithm, so it will give you the shortest pass. And because the Bellman Ford, it can give you the, it can reason on negative edges as well. Right. But it will find the shortest pass. And we have another question uh, again from Mustafa that is, is there an extension for STNs that allow this junction of nodes, modeling something like one event can happen or another? Yes, well, there's a, I mentioned the disjunctive STN, but it fits into a, a broader class of uh, temporal constraint network where this is uh, handled. Yes, uh, and if I, I just add, uh, since Mustafa was most, I, I, I interpret the question as whether you can skip nodes uh, in the STNs. And so the, there is an extension that is called CTP conditional temporal networks, in which you can condition some part of the network. Yeah, which is the, you have this reference there as well. Okay. Nice TM. Yeah. Okay, so I guess you can uh, take the floor, Andrea. Yes. Uh -huh. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Where is it? Here it is. Okay. Okay, so um, Arthur introduced uh, uh, temporal reasoning. Now we, is, we are switching back uh, to, to planning. 
And let me start by introducing a bit action, what is called action-based languages. So uh, as usual, if you want to model uh, a system in planning, you need some kind of formal language to express uh, essentially which, which are the possible transitions in your, uh, <clears throat> in your system. And for temporal planning, there are a number. Probably the most popular one, especially in the academic world, is, is PDDL version 2.1, supports time. And the extension that you have there, I am, I'm assuming you are pretty much familiar with uh, uh, PDDL in the classical sense, is that you can also have durative actions, so actions that are not instantaneous, but have a non-zero duration. Um, and uh, you add uh, duration constraints, so you can, express, uh, you can express constraints on the possible durations. So for example, you can say that uh, the duration of this action move is greater or equal than five time units and smaller or equal than 10 time units. Okay, so the plan, the job of the planner is gonna be to select first uh, when to start uh, and if to execute this action. Second, how long uh, this action is gonna be. So it's a decision of the planner. Then, oops, preconditions and effects are extended in order to specify whether the precondition is to be checked at start. So when the action, in the moment when the action starts, at end, so when the moment, uh, at the moment in, in which the action terminates, so at the end of the interval, or overall, sort of a durative condition that needs to be maintained throughout uh, the execution of the action. And similarly for the effects. Effects can be at start, so Im immediately when you start the action, change the value of some predicates of some variables, or uh, at end, so the effect is gonna be applied uh, at the ending time, okay? So you can imagine in your Gantt chart, uh, having uh, these specific points in time in which uh, effects are, apl are applied or conditions are checked, okay? Um, this is the very same problem modeled in another language that is called ANIMAL, uh, Action Notation Modeling Language. Um, and this is very si similar if you want, it's a bit more readable in my opinion, but uh, um, it, it expresses the very same thing. So you have uh, your actions, it has a duration, you have your, your way of constraining the duration of the actions, and uh, you have the starting time and the ending time in which you can do conditions or effects, okay? Um, this is not the only way for modeling uh, um, temporal planning. So these are essentially interval-based languages in which uh, actions uh, are assumed to be intervals uh, and you have special, uh, let's say, syntax and special semantics for expressing conditions and effects uh, throughout the interval, okay? There are also point-based languages, like for example, NDL, in which you only decide when to start an action. The action is instantaneous, so you can check the precondition of the action when you, when you start the action, but then you have the effects that are delayed in time. So you can say like, uh, uh, the action has a certain precondition, X needs to be true, but Y is gonna be set to, to false after 10 time units, for example. And then there is TPP, in which instead you have uh, uh, only instantaneous actions, so it's, it's very much like classical planning, but then you add uh, temporal information on top of that, so sort of a, a constraint on the trajectory. Um, probably you encountered this problem already, uh, if, if, you, if you've seen a version of PDDL that uh, deal with time or continuous uh, uh, quantities, that is, uh, uh, there is this problem of epsilon separation. So the idea is, again, if you imagine your Gantt chart, you don't want to have two events happening at the same time if they cannot be freely reordered. So for example, if there is an effect setting X to true and another effect from another action setting X to false, you don't want them to happen at the same time because otherwise in that point X is not well defined, so to say, it's not clear which of the two effects is gonna be, be applied after the other, so which is the value of X after the effect, okay? Um, and so, in order to solve this problem that our languages have came up with different techniques, and in particular, there are two ways. So either you have an epsilon fixed a priori, in which you require uh, two events that are uh, mutually exclusive, so that, that cannot be freely reordered, to be separated by this amount uh, of time that is known. Uh, for example, you know that uh, in order to execute your plan, your microcontroller has a resolution of one millisecond, and so you don't want two uh, effects, two actions to be scheduled uh, closer than one millisecond. So you don't want to enter this resolution. 
And if you do this assumption, if effectively your time interpretation is discrete. Uh, otherwise, you can ask the planner, and this is, for example, the animal uh, interpretation of time when you use uh, the continuous time. That is, the planner needs to find an epsilon. So the planner will search for a plan in which the effects are not going to be one of at the very same same time of the, uh, as the other, but they are separated by some time amount. But how much uh, is this amount uh, is going to be part of the solution? Okay, so this is just a small caveat, but it makes uh, quite a lot of problem if you if you if you implement a temporal planner or if you use temporal planning. Now, uh, from a theoretical point of view, when you add time in this way. So you, you start from the classical planning. So you, you have your state representation, you, you have all your heuristic search techniques and blah, blah, blah. And you add the time, actually you, are, uh, you have essentially different way of doing it. Okay, so I introduced you before with PDDL 2.1 in which you have, uh, if you remember, conditions that can be expressed at start uh, throughout the duration, so overall or at end, and you have effects that are at start or at end. And so this is a quite expressive language, but if you consider, uh, let's say, a restriction in which you can only specify effects at start, for example, what happens? Well, there is this paper by Cushing that is very important. Uh, essentially, it, he, he identified this family of languages. You can read this figure as follows. So when you have this L is the language, at uh, the bottom you will see start or end, so S or E, whether you are allowed to specify effects at start or at end of an action. And uh, uh, above uh, you will have S, O, and D. So if you, if you are allowed to specify uh, conditions at the start overall or at the end of, uh, um, of a plan, of, of, uh, of an action, sorry. And actually you, you can basically derive the, this lattice of, of different possible languages. But what is really interesting is that uh, the, there is this, this boundary, how I hope you can see it between the gray and the white and the white area that divides what is temporally expressive from what is temporally simple. So, and, and this is important because different techniques will be complete or incomplete depending on whether the problem that you are dealing with is temporally expressive or temporally simple. Essentially, uh, the, the idea is that temporally simple, temporally expressive languages allow you to create a problem in which the only possible solutions are concurrent. And a solution is concurrent when it is impossible to have uh, a solution in which you have uh, um, no actions that, that do, do overlap in time. So temporal over overlapping is really, really needed for, uh, for this kind of problems. Instead, languages that are temporally simple, no matter which is the problem, you are guaranteed that if there is a solution, then there exists a, there exists a solution that is sequential. So in which uh, you basically have one action after the other and you don't really need to overlap them in time. Okay? As an example of a temporally expressive uh, 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 problem is Matzeller. You can find it uh, online in the, tempor in the standard uh, IPC benchmarks. And, and there the problem is that uh, you have this, this light uh, that, that is needed in order to mend a fuse in a dark room and you need to have the light while you, you do your operation. So you have this during, uh, let's say, constraints that forces all your solution to be concurrent. Okay, so this is an important notion. Very quickly, uh, uh, an extension about my, what I said before about complexity. Uh, actually, if you disallow action self-overlapping, so you are not interested in plans in which as the same instance of a ground action can overlap with itself, then the complexity of planning drops to p-space complete in both discrete case and uh, dense time case. Okay, this is just a small note. Now let's talk about business. So let's, let's see how, how can we solve planning problems <coughs> in planners, in I mean, how, how the techniques work. So probably you can think uh, yourself to a very simple solution that is, uh, let's just forget about time. Uh, let's plan as, it, as if it were a classical planning problem and then reattach time afterwards. I already told you that uh, uh, for some problems when they are temporally simple, the solution is sequential. So probably you, you can uh, essentially disregard the timing, um, plan with your favorite heuristic search technique and then 
post-process the solution in order to apply a plan. And this is an approach that actually exists, and it, when it is applicable, it works quite well. This is an example. So suppose that your favorite planner came up with a solution uh, time abstracted A and then B. And <clears throat> further suppose that uh, the start of A supports start of B. So for example, there is an effect in the starting of action A that uh, uh, is required in order to fulfill a condition on the starting on, of B. So the first thing that you can do is to reattach duration. So A before B means uh, you have your interval that comes before another interval. Allen algebra that Arthur just explained, right? So it's, it's just an, a, a relation between the two. You can do slightly better. Uh, if, you, if you look at, the, at this paper, it, has the, the, it explains the problem of reordering. So analyzing the uh, effects and co a condition at the different time points in order to basically squeeze this, uh, this Gantt chart and, uh, and reorder the events, maintaining the, the causal consistency of planning. And so you can, for example, come up with a solution like this one. Okay, so this is all, all fantastic. The problem is that in general, it is incomplete when you have required concurrency. So this approach is not in general able to deal with problem in which you need the concurrency to be a first class citizens. And the reason is that, uh, for example, if you want an, an action to be during another action, then compressing the action into, into, into a time abstracted one in which you don't have, uh, have time, this allows the planner to actually decide that B should happen during A, right? So there is no way for you to express this. And so how can we overcome this, uh, this limitation? Well, the first step is to essentially switch from interval algebra to point algebra. So moving from actions that are interval to time points that are the constituting, uh, let's say, event, events of the actions. In PDDL, they are just two. In more expressive language, there can be more than two. So maybe it's not only simply the start of A and the end of A, but maybe you have events in the middle. But the idea is all, is all the same. So you, you, you identify throughout your action which are the, the event. And for each event, you create an instantaneous action, okay? Now, now we have a set of instantaneous actions. So again, we have a hammer, let's try to use it. So we can use heuristic search and see how it works. Uh, the problem, we still have a problem, right? Because uh, yes, we can now decide to start A and then later start C. So this is basically saying that C will happen within A because you have decided to start A, not to, not to end it but we still have this fun out problem, right? We still don't know how to decide how much time should pass between this start of A and this start of C. And the problem becomes even worse when you have uh, continuous time or, well, dense time or even continuous time. For example, here you can wait one time unit, 1.1, 1.11 and so on and so forth. You have an infinite number of possible waits. And the, the, the thing is, is even worse if you assume the, the domain of the real, so you can wait for pi time units, right? Okay, so how can we overcome this, this problem? Well, one technique is called decision epoch, and decision epoch augments heuristic search. So now we are, we are not using our planner as a black box anymore. We open the box and, uh, and we augment also how the planning state is represented within the, plan, the planner. So, as you probably know, in heuristic search, typically your state is represented as a total assignment uh, of your predicates, of, your, of the variables of your problem. Now we need more. And in particular, we add an agenda that is a list of uh, open actions. So actions that needs to happen into the future with their uh, happening time. And a timestamp, so a number T, okay? Um, at each step, we can either start a new action, okay? And when we start an action, we might uh, create a commitment to, into the future or we can advance time. So let's focus a bit on, on this example here. Suppose that we have two actions, A and B, and that the duration of A is five and the duration of B is two. You start initially with your, let's say, classical, let's say, assignment uh, coming from the initial state of your problem. Then you have time equals zero and you have empty agenda. And you can maybe do, I don't know, start, starting A or starting B. Let's suppose that your, your search first uh, goes into this direction and you start A. You don't advance the time, time is still zero, but you decided that, that A 
started. So in the future, at time five, A is gonna end, right? And, and you basically bookmark this information into the state. And this information is propagated in all the children until we decide to clear this commitment, okay? And now you can do two things. You can either wait for some time or starting another action immediately. So suppose that you start another action immediately. Again, you don't advance the, the, time, the timestamp, you do add additional commitment in, in your agenda, okay? Instead, if you, wa if you want to, to let time elapse, at that point, and this is very critical for this uh, uh, approach, instead of, uh, I don't know, deciding whether to wait one time unit, two time units, three time units, no, 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 you, you wait five because five is the smallest time that you have in your agenda. So you basically jump into the next uh, event in order to do it, right? You, you decided that uh, A is gonna is, uh, started, so you, you have to do end of A sooner or later, and end of A should happen at time five, and so you jump immediately at time five. And so the timestamp is gonna be set to the minimum over all the agenda, and now you have an event that happens at time zero, so it needs to be done immediately, you end A. One interesting point is that uh, when you have multiple things in your agenda, like, like in this state here, for example, and you let time elapse, you let time elapse for the minimum and you update the agenda, right? So you say, well, um, the, the time uh, jumps from zero to two, but now I don't need to wait five time units before ending A, I just need to wait for three time units, right? So you can imagine down here in the search tree that happens down here that you are gonna search uh, at some point you're gonna jump to, to, to the point in which end of A happens, okay? So this is somehow a way of deciding um, when to, to resolve this fun out problem, okay? That you have in heuristic search. And the small note here is that uh, clearly you want uh, a goal state is not simply a, a state in which the goal condition is satisfied. You also want the agenda to be empty. So you don't want to terminate your planning procedure when you still have open actions to do you want your agenda to be empty. Different planners that implement this approach, uh, in particular, well, SAPA was one of the first ones and the TFD, Temporal Fast Downward, uh, if you look at the international planning competition is actually one of the best performing planners that you can, you can find for, for PDDL 2.1. So it's a successful approach, but uh, it's still incomplete. Unfortunately, the fact, so, so this fact here, that time can only advance to the first event in the agenda is not enough in general. It allows you to, to, to express some kind of concurrency, but not, not, not all the kind of concurrency that the language allows you. So for example, suppose that uh, uh, G1 and G2 are two goals that I need to, to achieve, and suppose that O is initially true. So in, in this problem here, essentially what I'm saying is that uh, the end of B and the end of A needs to happen within C because C sets uh, X to true at the beginning and sets it to false at the end. And since both of them require X, we need them to happen in this, uh, in this interval here. This construction is, 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 uh, is usually called uh, uh, clip action. So it's, uh, it's basically sort of a, a staple that you are, you are using in order to clip these two time points in time. Okay, and so this planning problem has clearly a solution uh, because this Gantz art, so th th this drawing here is a witness, is, is a possible solution. You just need to put the starting times, but decision epoch planners will not be able to find this plan and it will simply say that the problem is unsolvable. The reason is that they cannot start action B at this arbitrary time within A, right? So th they decide to start A, then if they, they cannot start, well, they, they will try to start B immediately, but then, then, then they will fail because the distance between this point and this point will be bigger than three. And so it's impossible to, to solve. Um, they need to wait, for example, four time units, for example, and then start B. But this is impossible because they, they simplify their search by advancing to the first event in the agenda. So this is a, a witness of incompleteness. And finally, we can see how to put everything together. So the, the STNs that, that Arthur explained and the completeness. And so the idea here is not simply to, to enlarge the planning state with an agenda of future events, but also with an STN of past and future time points. Here is what I mean. Suppose that I start with the initial state here, and then I decide to start B. 
similarly to the decision epoch uh, thing, but this time instead of simply keeping a, a time a time instance saying that this is against time zero, no, I'm saying well I'm starting v, so in the future there's gonna be an ending of v, and I create uh, an STN, essentially a, a linear program, a, a set of constraints uh, that tells me that uh, no matter what, in this branch, so from now on, th this constraint is gonna be kept uh, for all the sub tree here in the search. The end of B minus the start of B is gonna be equal to two because we are assuming that the duration of B is equal to two. And this is consistent, right? If you, if you run Bellman Ford, for example, you will find that this is a consistent network. Then you decide to start A. Again, I'm adding this constraint plus I'm saying that the start of B needs to happen before the start of A. So I have this uh, smaller or equal, actually a smaller will be more, more correct here. Um, and this is because the time advance is implicit. So I'm deciding that this S3 is possible just because the, the state representation, so the assignment to the, to, to the, to, to the predicates, uh, in S1 is such that I can apply the starting of A, so the precondition of the of A are satisfied, so I can jump to S3, but in order to maintain this causal relationship, uh, maybe starting of B created something, I don't know, achieved um, set, set X to true, and start of A requires X to be true, so I need to maintain this relative ordering. There are some, some approaches that use partial ordering, but just to keep things simple, in this example, we're gonna use total order, okay? Then, Suppose again that the search will, uh, will jump, we will search and, and we will decide to do the end of A. So nothing to add uh, as new constraints when you have A, except for the fact that end of A is the, is the last time point. So we have this total ordering chain that is growing. Of course, you can express this in STN, right? You can simply do start of uh, uh, B minus, uh, sorry, start of A minus start of B greater or equal than zero, right? And then if we try to do the end of B, we will end up with this constraint problem that is unfortunately unsatisfiable. So is, in, is an STN that is gonna be inconsistent. It will have essentially a negative cycle as, as Arthur explained before, because it's impossible, right? To have, uh, uh, to, to have A during B. So essentially I started day and I ended day, but before I started B and, and I want to close it afterwards. So you cannot fit five in, into an interval of two. And so this is inconsistent and you need to backtrack. And the search goes on and on and on and on, okay? The key idea here is that time is symbolic, right? We are not representing, I don't know how, at, at which time the system will reach this particular state as one. I simply know that there are some constraints to be satisfied. But the, the, key, I, the key intuition is that if I'm able to find a path from the initial state to a goal state that is consistent, so in which all the STNs throughout the paths are consistent, then this is, a, this is a real plan. And I can extract a plan by simply taking a model of the STN, so an assignment of values to the time points, and that will tell me exactly when to start and when to end each action. That's the key idea. A number of planners implement this approach. Uh, there is a family done by the King's College uh, London, Crike, Popef, Colin, Optic. There are others, for example, Tamer, it's a planner that we developed at PK that uses this idea for animal. And there are others actually. Um, one important note, so all the three approaches that I presented so far are based on heuristic search, as you, as you noted. Um, typically, when you are in classical planning, you are used to deal with graph search spaces, right? Instead, you know, my drawings, I draw on uh, three, uh, three structures, right? And the reason is that in general, it's a, it's a bit hard to uh, recognize that uh, you, you are in a state that is equal to, to a state in which you, you, already, you already visited. It is simple in classical planning because you have an assignment, you have just the assignment to the variables, you simply compare the two assignments if they are equal. It doesn't matter how you get there, you can go on, right? It, the, the future is independent from, from, from the past, is Markovian in some sense. Temporal planning is not like that, right? If you, if you, are, if you arrive in a state but you consumed a lot of time doing uh, some useful, uh, useless actions, right? Uh, and then you, you visit later in, in your search, uh, the same state in the sense that the same assignment to the, to the predicates, but uh, you arrived it early, then maybe there is a plan from uh, starting from, from this, this second state that, that was not available from the previous one. So you really need to re-explore it. Unless 
you are able to, to, to prove a subsumption. You are, you are able to prove that all the plans starting from one state can actually start from another state. And this, is, this can be tricky. It is relatively simple in decision epoch because you can actually check, you, you have your timestamp and you can check if one, uh, if the two timestamps are equal or even if one is bigger than the other. So if you arrive, if you arrive in, a, in a certain state earlier, you can always wait, right, in general. So it, the, that state will, uh, will be subsumed. When you have STN, things become more complicated because STNs are graph and you need to check whether they are isomorphic or one subsumption of the other. And so in general, it's very hard to do. It's actually MP-hard. Uh, you can under approximate equality uh, sometimes uh, and you can have a look at this paper if you're interested in to. Just, just remember that uh, in, it's the, the fact that we have a graph structure here is a bit more tricky than in classical planning. And finally, uh, I'm not a super expert about heuristics themselves, but essentially the power of these state-based techniques uh, come from the fact that uh, they, they derive from classical planning and they can generalize the powerful heuristics that you have for classical planning. And so for the, the simplest thing that you can do is to simply say, well, this is a temporal planning problem. Let's just forget about time. So relax the temporal aspects. So anything that can be done in the classical sense, um, sorry, any, anything that can be done in the temporal sense will be possible in this relaxation. So let's just use a relaxation of uh, this, cla this classical planning domain and use it as a guidance. So you can use H plus, H add, HFF, uh, whichever heuristics for classical planning will be provide some kind of guidance uh, also in temporal planning, but uh, they're gonna be blind to time. So if you have some problems, some, some dead ends that arise from the fact that uh, uh, the, 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 the STM becomes unsati unsatisfiable, so you have uh, uh, non-schedulability in some branches, th these, these heuristics will be blind to that. They, they will not help for you. There are other approaches. So for example, IRIC, uh, they have this uh, um, uh, decision epoch uh, that is essentially transforming the decision epoch times into action cost, and they have this, uh, this con con context enhanced uh, additive heuristic or the, the uh, planning family, Popeff, uh, uh, Colin, and so on. They used the derivations of, of, the, of the temporal relaxed planning graph. So essentially it's like uh, the usual planning graph that is used as heuristics, for example, in uh, HFF, but in, in enhanced with temporal information. Okay, so all of these, just to say that there are a number of heuristics to guide this kind of uh, heuristic search approaches. But and they are derived by extending uh, classical planning versions to uh, to the time. Okay. Quickly, because I'm, I'm I think I'm using a lot of time. Uh, another approach is temporal planning as satisfiability. So probably you are familiar with SAT plan, in which uh, instead of approaching the, the general problem of classical planning, you bound. So you are interested in plans that are uh, of length up to k or exactly k, right? you encode this problem as a SAT problem, so as a satisfiability problem, and you have the, pr the property that any model of the formula encodes a valid plan. And if the formula is unsatisfiable though, you don't know whether the problem is really unsolvable, so there is no plan in the planning problem, or if just your, your bound is insufficient and needs to be increased. This is es essentially the very same thing in, uh, in the verification community with the bounded model checking, okay? You can use the very same approach, basically, uh, also for temporal planning. The, the only point is that SAT is not enough. SAT only deals with the Boolean variable, so you can encode the discrete decisions there, but it's hard to encode the time passing, right? So the, the, the amount of time and the durations is very hard to encode into SAT. And so you need an extension of SAT that is called satisfiability modulo theory. And in particular, you want to use linear arithmetic or even just uh, um, uh, difference logic that Arthur mentioned before. At a glance, essentially satisfiability modulo theory is an extension of SAT that allows you to decide satisfiability of, of a first order formula. So for example, you have a formula like this one in which the variables are numeric, right? For example, X is a number. This is a, a problem in the theory of, uh, well, is, um, Linear, linear arithmetic in general, in particular, this is just, that, just difference logic because you don't have a sum, you don't have the plus symbol. Um, and uh, you have uh, the usual and and or conjunction. So you can really write Boolean 
formulas. You can also have Boolean variables. And the question is whether there is a model, there is an assignment to the variables for this formula or not, right? And depending again on, on different theories, it, uh, the model can exist or not. So for example, if you require X to be an integer, there is no solution for this problem. Is the problem is unsatisfiable. If instead you assume X to be a rational or a real, uh, there is a solution and for example, a solution is 7.5, okay? Practical features, that is what we, we mostly care about. Many theories are supported in SMT, not just numbers, but also other things, arrays uh, to represent memories, uh, bit vectors, and so on. They have, uh, they have efficient and well-supported implementations. They basically extend the efficiency of such solving that comes from uh, CDCL uh, and, and, and generalize it with, the, with, these, uh, with these theories. Um, they do have a common language to express problem that is always nice. So it's called SMTLib and they have annual solver competition. So you can, you can have a look at which are the implementations around, which is more, most performance for your, for your problem at hand. So I advise you to, to have a look. Um, I will go very quickly on this one. So just to give you the, the flavor of how an encoding and temporal planning works, you can have a look at the, the paper up here if you are interested. Essentially, um, the, the key idea is to replicate the value of the variables to each uh, time point, and you want to create a certain number of time points. So the encoding, the encoding in SMT will be bounded by the number of events in your plan. And exactly as, as in SAT plan, if the formula is unsatisfiable, you don't know whether a plan doesn't exist or if simply your bound is too low and you, and you need to, to update the bound, okay? Um, so you, you create one variable for each of the variables in your original problem and you replicate this assignment to each of the, of the steps. Then you want uh, to, have a variable, to have additional variables, booleans, uh, that tells you at each step whether you are starting a certain snap action, right? I want to start A, I want to end A, okay? And, and each of these decisions are gonna be encoded by a Boolean variable in your formula. You need some way of, of representing absolute time of, of the steps. And now you have numbers. So you can have uh, a new variable like TI that is a rational. And you can then say that, uh, I don't know, TI minus TJ is gonna be the, the, the time elapse between the event, the ith event and the jth event, okay? Uh, then you want to enforce action duration using difference logic or real, real arithmetic, okay? You want uh, to impose uh, the snap actions, the, so the preconditions basically. So you, here you are saying, uh, this is very rough, right? It's, it's like an abstract encoding. You are saying that uh, if at this step I, I'm taking action A, then the precondition of A at time I needs to be satisfied. Preconditions will be the, the conditions at the start. Similarly for effects, so if I'm taking the snap action at time I, I want to have the effects in the next step Actually, there are some encoding in which they, the effects are encoding in the, in the same uh, logical steps. So the different encodings, but the, the idea is the same. Um, then you want to add a mutex constraint in order to say, well, these two actions cannot live together because they have the effects on the same variable, for example. And finally, remember that this is a logical encoding. So if you don't specify anything, the, the solver is able to, to assign the, the, the values to whatever value it wants, unless there is a constraint. And so you want to have this kind of frame actions that enforces the fact that in planning, a value only changes when there is an effect. If there is no effect, then uh, the value cannot change. And you can say it by saying, well, for each step, if the value changed, then there must, there must uh, have been an action, and this action actually has an effect on, on, on this specific V, okay? This is a, a bit a gist of, uh, of how an encoding will work. Um, and there are different actual planners that implement the, these approaches. And here you have a number of them. I will not go through it. Uh, I'm only saying that uh, SMT is not the only possible target technique for this kind of uh, encoding. For example, you can use MIP, so mixed integer programming, uh, especially if you're interested in optimization. Uh, that one could be a, a good choice. Um, Super quickly, I mentioned at the beginning that having just a snap action start and end is not, uh, uh, is not the only possible way. There are languages like Animal that allows you to express uh, effects or conditions throughout an interval. Like you can say, 
Well, in this action, make treatment after, I don't know, uh, ah, 60 time units, done is gonna be set to true. And then after 100 time units, uh, I want uh, peak to be equal to true, okay? So you can express conditions, effects, at points different than the starting or the ending. And so uh, this, is a, this is quite useful in practice, but it's supported by fewer planners, okay? So especially in the state, uh, uh, let's say state-oriented world. This is just to introduce a bit to what Arthur will say in a moment, that in general, state-oriented techniques are quite powerful if you have a, a problem that is relatively complicated from the planning point of view, but relatively weak from the scheduling point of view. Instead, the techniques that, uh, that Arthur will present are typically complementary, okay? Okay, so this is it for this part. And I will cede the floor to Arthur and see if there are questions. Oh, there are. Yeah, there are questions. I've started answering some of them. Uh, given the time, I propose that you do it directly in the chat. Okay, I'll do it in the chat. We can maybe take answers, uh, the questions at the end. <clears throat> okay, so time oriented techniques. Uh, well, so if we if we think a bit about uh, what we've just seen, uh, essentially in temporal planning there are um, three answers that we need to answer, which is what actions do we need to do, what are the parameters of those actions, and when we want to do them. Right. So when we ground the problem, we tie the first answers together. So we, we when we have an operator, it's a combination of an action and specific parameters. Right. And then we, when we do forward search in the state space, essentially what the decision that we take is which action, which operator to execute and at a given point in time, which is given by progression search. And so the, the key idea there is that in state-oriented forward search, you take all three decisions at once, uh, which is necessary to extract a state but at the same time, it's error prone because it means that you have lots of possibilities in your decision. And that there's a high probability that you make the wrong choice. Uh, but the, the good part of it is that it enables extremely helpful research heuristics. So you have lots of possible choice, but you have very uh, good guidance to make them, let's say. Right? But of course, it is, this can be suboptimal. And if you look at a plan like this one, where you have two actions, and there's no particular ordering on them, right? And you look at uh, the sequence of state that is traversed. So if they um, start at the same time, uh, essentially we'll traverse three states. So A and C for the location of Ellis and Bob respectively, uh, both moving, and then B and D. But if you change just a bit the ordering of the action, then you will go through a different sequence of actions. And for each uh, particular ordering, which is perfectly arbitrary there, because there's actually no relations between these two constraints, um, you will go through different states, and this can uh, cause difficulties to state space plans. And so the key idea in time oriented planning that you're not going to look into states where well, state is essentially just a slice of those, um, of, of those uh, evolution of state variables, uh, but you're going to look at the evolution of particular state variables uh, in isolation. So in, if you look at all different figures there, you can see that if you look at a single state variable, there's actually no changes. Uh, even though the start and end time might change, you still have the same sequence of things. So A moving B for the first one, regardless of the ordering with the other actions, right? Okay, so uh, I've set a timeline and we can say that the timeline essentially denotes the evolution of a particular state variable through time. So here I have a timeline that gives me the location of Alice. That will be A, uh, it first be at A. And if, if I go through time, it will be, it will have the value A, then it will be have the value of moving and then the value b okay so that's the evolution of the state variable through time and so these timelines are filled with tokens and a token gives you the value of 
the value a of the state variable here log Alice and as two things attached which is which are time points denoting the start and end of uh, the token okay uh, so now um, how do we express problems so what we've seen so far is action based model where you have some condition when essentially what they express that when you have some condition that are true then you can produce a particular effect so if, if i take this H, this action a it means that if i'm at l1 i can be at l3 i can produce the effect of being at l3 and i have a similar action b okay so that's what you're probably most used to uh, and there's another uh, representation that is that has been very influential and still is, is actually research, which is a timeline-based model uh, where you don't have actions, but instead you have uh, condi conditions associated to tokens. So in a timeline-based uh, model, the equivalent of these two actions would be something like this, where you pose the condition that if you have a token that's saying that I'm at L3, then one of the two patterns should hold. So either I have a token saying that I'm at L1, that should be just before my at L3 token, okay? And which corresponds to the precondition and effect of the action A, or the other case that I have a token at L2 uh, that is exactly, that is just before my at L3 tokens, right? So when you go from action to timeline, essentially you lose the explicitness of actions, but you can reconstruct them uh, by stating conditions and essentially patterns to enforce in the set of timelines. And there's a, a formal result for this as well. Okay, so we've we've talked a bit about tokens, and I'm going to to say that the one we've seen are effects tokens, where an effect token gives you the value of a state variable over a temporal interval T, S, T, E. And these are essentially facts that I think that you know are going to occur. And you can use it to represent action effects, but also initial facts or even uh, time initial literal. So I could say with a construct like this one that the satellite is visible during a particular temporal interval, okay? And I'm going to add a new one, which are condition stocking. Uh, and this has the same shape, so it's an association of a value to a state variable of the, the temporal interval, but this one say that we require that the, the state variable as the given value, but this is not something that we've established yet. So we can use this to express the condition of actions, the goals, or even temporally extended goals, because we can, um, we can specify on which temporal interval we want this to hold. And with these two constructs, we can express actions. So I'm going to go quite quickly for this one, but essentially it's an action that represents the fact that a robot R takes an object O at the location L. So we have the start and end time point for this action, which you can all see, also see there, so that's my action. I have duration constraints, so that's something that you can express in an STN. And then you can express conditions. So over the course of duration, of the, over the course of the, action which is tste i should have my robots be in location l which is this condition token there then slightly before and until a bit before the end of my action my object should be in the same location that this condition token there and you can see that you can easily express and you can see that you can also reason on this that you're not bound to express thing at the start or the end of the action which is the intermediate conditions in effect there. And so you have this condition that my object be in location L. And then I can also express effects. So here I'm going to say that at T E minus one, so just before the end of the action, uh, I will have the object be uh, in the gripper. That's an effect that starts at T E minus one. And I'm not sure when it's going, in, Typically, an effect persists until either the end of the world or until uh, another effect supplants it. And so here I've introduced uh, an artificial time point 
uh, that allows me to reason about this. But typically, it's unbounded in its order to, to go until infinity if there's no, uh, nothing, if nothing prevents it. And I have another effect saying that I'm busy, that the robot is busy uh, during the duration of the action. Okay. So that's how I represent an action as a set of tokens. And now I'm going to introduce two rules that govern um, what is possible to do with timeline. So the first one um, is that I should never have two effects tokens like these ones that impose, that concurrently impose a value to the staying state variable. So essentially this means that I'm not allow to have two effects token overlapping because it means that there's two conflicting assignments for the state variable. And this is something I can uh, enforce by such constraints saying that either they are talking about different state variables or the first one is before or the second one is before. Okay, this essentially separates them in time and uh, or enforce them to be on different timelines. At another rule of consistency, which is each condition token which must be uh, established by an effect token. Uh, and essentially this means that the following should all, so that it should exist an effect token such that they are the same state variable, they have the same value. So this means that the value that is um, um, produced by the effect corresponds to the one that is expected by the condition. And then the last thing that they should, uh, I mean, that the condition should be contained in the effects. So it means that uh, the condition is after the beginning of the effect and before the end of its persistence, right? So this time point there is the end of the persistence of this effect. Are the two conditions that I need to enforce? And now, how can I search with this? So I'm going to define a partial plan as a set of actions and a set of timelines with the ish, and, and each timelines has a few tokens as well. And then I have an additional thing, which is an STM. And this uh, is going to help me enforce constraints between the different time forms that occur in the actions and in the tokens. And then the way I, I plan, I start from an empty plan where I only have tokens representing the initial facts and the goals and we're going to see an example of this right after and then uh, once i have a partial plan it might be flowed which means that there might be violation of the consistency rules which are in supporting condition and conflicting assignments and then i have an algorithm that will systematically pick a flow so a problem in the partial plan and resolve it and this will give me a new partial plan and i can keep uh, reasoning like this until there's no uh, problems in my partial plan anymore. Okay, so this algorithm goes as follows. So I'm starting with a partial plan, which can be empty at first. And if there is no flow in this partial plan, well, then I can return it because it's a solution. It's a partial plan that has no problem, which is a solution, okay? If there are some flow, then I'm going to pick an arbitrary one. And I'm going to look at how can I resolve this flow. So it's a very general algorithm, but we're going to see an instantiation right after. Uh, so if there's no resolver for a flow, then it means that uh, I'm in a dead end. So I have a flow that I cannot fix. Uh, so the plan is, uh, is invalid. This partial plan is invalid and cannot be made valid. Anyway, if I don't have, uh, if I have some resolvers, I can choose one of them. So I can make a non-deterministic choice, which means essentially that it's a choice on which I can backtrack. Uh, so I choose a resolver in the set of possible resolvers. I can apply this resolver, which will give me a new partial plan. And then I can repeat the process recursively until uh, essentially the procedure finishes, which means either I find a solution or I've explored all my branches and found no, no, valid, no valid plans. Okay. So we're going to see a, a quick example of how this works. So here I have displayed, here is my search tree where that's my current node. Here I'm going to show the different timelines. Here I have my, only my initial state 
uh, my initial facts, which are the effect that my robot is in L1 and my object is in L1 as well. And I have my condition that the object should be in L2. And at this point, I have no actions in my plan, which is the empty space there. Okay, so the way I proceed is that I look at the different flows. And here I have one flow, which is an unsupported condition. And now that I've selected this flow that I want to fix, I can look at the different resolves. So need, no, I need an effect supporting it. I can look at the existing ones, but there's known that will allow me to express that O is in L2. That's L1 and I need L2. But my only possibility is to have a new action place R O L2 and unify my condition with my effects. Okay, I have only one resolver, which means I only have one possibility to branch in my search space. So now I'm going to insert this action and this will insert all my condition tokens and my effects token as well. And now what's important to see is that I've made my effects entirely cover my condition, which means I've made it persist until at least the end of the condition. Okay, and now I've added a new action. Now I can repeat this process and look at what are the flows in my partial plan. So here I have two unsupported conditions. I can pick one, let's say this one. And I want to achieve this. I can look at the existing effects, but there's none that allow the object to be in the gripper. Uh, so instead I have two options, which is to either pick the object from the location L1 or from the location L2. Uh, and this will introduce an effect that's always in the gripper and that can unify this with my condition. And so if I pick the first option, I will insert a new action, insert new tokens as well. So I have new conditions, new effects. And I've made uh, my effects entirely cover and, and do um, support my condition. Okay, so at this point, I have two actions in my plan, and I have a, essentially a mess of tokens that are partially ordered, uh, but th that's fine for search algorithms. And now I've started going down my search tree, and I've actually made a decision by going the left branch there. So I will, I will keep doing this process, and I can look at the next unsupported condition, which is that O should be at L1. So that's, again, an arbitrary flow that I'm, I'm going to, to address. And now I have another option, which is to support it with this uh, effect by essentially extending, making sure, and adding the temporal constraint that this effect persists until the end of this condition. Uh, I could have another option, which is to add a new action uh, by placing the object in L1. But that's not what I'm going to do. So I'm going to unify uh, with my existing effects. And I'm going to repeat this process so here I'm going to solve this condition there by again unifying it. And now I have this condition I want to fulfill and I'm going to add a new action. That's actually the only thing I can do there uh, to support it. Uh, okay, I have one more condition to fulfill and this one I can again um, support by extending this effect there to persist until the end of this condition. Okay, so now I've introduced all my actions, I've supported of all my conditions, and I still have one thing that is problematic, which is that here I have overlapping effects. So I'm imposing the uh, value to the same state variable with different tokens. And even though it's the same value, it's still a problem. Uh, essentially, it means that there might be a, an instantaneous transition, and so at, there's a discontinuity in the value at the binary of tokens. And so the way I'm going to do this, so I have my flow of these conflicting tokens, and I'm going to force an ordering between them, uh, which is just a temporal constraint that will make everything move, it's essentially delaying the place action. And at this point, I have a partial plan that has no flows, so no conflicted tokens and no unsupported conditions. And this means that I have a solution plan, okay? 
that's the search process of uh, action-based uh, time-oriented planners, uh, but it's also very, very similar to the ones of timeline-based um, of planners that use a timeline-based representation. They actually use the same algorithm. They might have slightly different versions of the flows and resolvers, but the process is essentially the same one. Okay, so here what I can see that I've made a search tree and the question is, how can I explore it? Uh, so one common option is to do it in depth first. And it's quite common among timeline-based planners. But you can also do it through heuristic search uh, using A star or related algorithms. And I have two choices that I, can, that I have to make, which is, so the first one is which flow to fix so I can decide which unsupported condition I want to solve next. And the, the common thing to do is to choose the one with the least number of resolvers, because essentially the number of resolvers gives you the branching factor uh, in, your, um, in your search tree. If I have only one resolver, then I have only one option. And that's, uh, so that's something that I have to do and I, uh, I better do it right away, right? And the other thing that you can do is select which partial plan uh, or resolver, depending on, on the kind of search that, that you can do. Uh, so there's lots of domain specific um, heuristics to make this choice, especially in timeline based planners that have been deployed in, uh, in, in real scenarios. Uh, there's the option of using a list commitment as well, as I'm not going to detail. Uh, and the last option is to essentially evaluate the distance to a consistent plan. So a, a very simple thing to do with simple, yeah, quite simple heuristics would be to essentially count the number of flows that are left in your plan. And this gives you an idea of how many search steps that you have to do until you find a solution plan. That's the most basic one, uh, but there's more advanced one, both for timeline-based and uh, action-based plans. Okay. Arthur, yes. uh, maybe uh, you should uh, speed up to, to leave a, a bit of time between the end of your lecture and uh, the, the next lab. Yes, I have two more slides and I will be finished. Thank you. Okay, so the, the last uh, extension to it I want to mention is lifted planning, where you actually delay the binding of your parameters. So this means that you can take your action parameters and do not uh, give them values, but instead consider them as variables on which you can apply constraints. And in this setting, you complement the SCN with a, a CSP, so a binding constraint networks, that maintains the uh, possible values of these parameters. Um, and the, the key idea there is that if you have ground action, so if you're not doing lifted planning, when you have this flow there where you want to solve this unsupported condition, where you have to choose between those two pick actions. Eh? You can choose to pick from the L1 place or from the L2 place, but this is actually not imposed by your condition, right? And when you do lifted planning, the way you're going to do this is that you still have the same condition, but you're going to insert an action with variables in place instead of the parameters. And then when you unify the effects, you're going to do that both by adding the necessary temporal constraints, but also binding constraints on the value of these parameters. And what this does is that to unify, they are only need to bind the O variable to the O object, uh, but I can leave open the choice of which robot I'm going to use and in which location. And the very useful thing is that now I only have one uh, possibility to support this condition, which means I don't have to make an actual choice in my search tree. With all the CST based extension that I'm not going to present. And I just want to conclude this part on, on mentioning planning as scheduling or planning and scheduling. So in temporal planning, we address these three questions. So which action, what actions to do, uh, how we want to do this, which is which parameters and when we want to do this. So this when is what 
um, separates temporal planning from classical planning. Uh, but we have a very active field of scheduling that is uh, concerned with these how and when questions. And uh, there's very much your inefficient tooling in, in operations research and constrained program communities. And it's important to keep in mind that many planning problems are actually very naturally into our scheduling. And in fact, you can think, I mean, if you have a problem, if, if it's not piece space hard, uh, then you might be uh, overshooting by using an alternative planners, right? And it might be more natural to express it as scheduling or other things, especially if you want to have guarantees on optimality or something like this, right? So I'm just giving here a, a good entry point to explore the, the space of scheduler, which is CP optimizer, which is probably the most uh, advanced uh, scheduler tool available right now. Okay, and with this, uh, we can maybe conclude. So Andrea, if you want to, to conclude. Okay, Andrea is not there. Uh, well, so just to summarize, so temporal planning is deciding what to do and when to do it. We've seen state-oriented techniques and time-oriented techniques. So the first one goes uh, in for what, well, for um, heuristic search, you go, you search forward in the space of, uh, in the space of states, which you can explore to have strong heuristic guidance. And it's uh, probably the most uh, active field of research right now. Uh, while in time oriented, you much closer to scheduling techniques, but it's odd, uh, which has some uh, good sides in the search space, but it's hard to provide uh, efficient heuristic guidance. And to maybe state that it's a very active area of research, and especially um, well, all the extension that you can consider for um, for classical planning, while well, you can consider them with time in addition to, to this particular extension. So there's one that is especially relevant for temporal planning because you cannot do without time to do this is the one where you have continuous change. Uh, and this is this will be at least partly tackled during, I think tomorrow's lecture of uh, numeric planning, but there's also other uh, very active areas of research there. Okay, thank you. And I think if there's any questions, any quick questions, maybe it should be the time to do it. I'm back, by the way. I was muted and cannot unmute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Arthur. Thank you, Andrea, for the, this uh, very comprehensive and uh, pedagogical uh, lecture. Uh, in addition, you have been able to present um, a lecture that was necessarily temporal, since you have been able to answer our questions while lecturing. <laughs> that was uh, uh, nice uh, to be this uh, parallelism. So my suggestion is we, we need to leave a, a break before the next lab. And uh, if there are further questions, several have already been uh, addressed. If there are further questions, I would like to, to ask the uh, students to, to put them on the Slack channel and um, please address them together with the questions uh, from the viewers offline. Unless there is something very pre present you, you need to add, we better leave um, a bit of, uh, of uh, break time before the next lab. Okay, thank you very much.